Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another great episode of the Red, White, and You Show. This episode is being sponsored by Trailblazing Communications, tools for taking back your life. Well, friends, today I have a real treat for you. I have with me Brian DeRozan. He is an American actor, filmmaker, and uh, director, and he was born in Oakland. He was raised in the Midwest. And, uh, you know, he played some football. He's a 49ers fan. Hell, let's just talk to him face-to-face. Brian, welcome to the Red, White News Show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule and and chatting with us uh, this morning. So share with us, um, you know, I know you were uh, talking about your uh, earlier, we were just talking about your latest work, Very Frightening Tales. Um, And we're going to get to that in a minute. And also about your reoccurring role on Star Trek Picard, the series, um, and the other stuff. But share with um, folks if they're really not maybe too familiar of some of your past works, who Brian DeRozan is. Yeah, thank you. So, um Thank you for that intro. Uh, as you mentioned, actor and filmmaker. Um, I've been in the business for, gosh, off and on for more than 10 years, but it's really only been uh, the past two or three uh, that things have really started to take off for me. So um, yeah, Star Trek Picard, that's been my biggest role to date. It's a recurring uh, role as a Romulan officer. Obviously, we filmed, we finished uh, season one. And we're prepared to begin season two. But then, of course, uh, COVID happened. And so, right. uh, uh, yeah, that kind of threw a big monkey wrench into everyone's schedule, obviously. Right. Um, and I just found out recently that they are... Uh, now casting and getting the ball rolling for season two. Uh, now, whether I'm going to get to come back or not remains to be seen. I guess that that depends on what um, what happens with the storyline, etc. Uh, but if you watch season one, there was some resolution between the Romulans and and Picard, etc. So we'll Love see. It. Were but you? It, uh, let me ask a little bit. Is um, Brian? Were you a big sci-fi? You know, a fan, were you, uh, you know, growing up, were you a big fan of this, the sci-fi world? Uh, 100%. In fact, um, the original Star Wars film um, was probably the first, the first time I ever had the idea right. of making, making movies and being an actor. Oh, wow. Way back. Way back. Yeah, yeah. So about way back in the 70s, that, that first initial movie when it came out, um, what was it? Seventy? Was it seventy-eight? Seventy-six? Seventy-eight? Uh, it was right in right at, right around there. It was later, but right. when I was old enough to see it. Oh sure, okay. But uh, but yeah, it was a very early age for me. Right, right. Yeah. So I I'm sure that you know here you are coming full circle now as an adult as an actor. Here you are standing on the set, dressed as a Romulan. I mean, that's got to be like pinch me moment, right? Like, oh my God. Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was exciting, but to be honest, it was, it was maybe more exciting after we wrapped, after Mm. we were finished because you spend so much time preparing and, you know, funny story about it. Everything was so secretive around the show. Um, I had to sign a, a, an NDA before I could even audition. Sure. And I didn't even know what the show was. They had a, 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 a different name for it. So when I went in and read, uh, I was under the impression with such limited information, I thought, okay, well, this is either a battleship out at sea or a spaceship. I couldn't tell. <laughs> I did the audition, ended yep. up getting the part. And only when I went in to get fitted, I went into Universal to get fitted for prosthetics. And that's when I realized... This is Star Trek. <laughs> but it was, um, yeah, it was just any other audition, any other time of being on set and working. Um, obviously, uh, the uh, 
you know, the, the set itself was massive and impressive. Right. But it was really after, I think, that I got to kind of enjoy the moment because it was just sure. kind of work. And you, you just you work so hard and prepare so much for for those opportunities that when they come, it's kind of business as usual. Right. And then afterwards. But my family, especially my older brother, um, way more excited about it, like initially <laughs> than I would right. be. Yeah. Right, right. Well, and I suppose too, like a lot of times they have to add in the Hollywood magic, right? Like some of the green screen stuff, you know, all the other bells and whistles, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, very cool. Um, and I'm sorry to to kind of segue into your, your conversation, but I was like, boy, you know, it's it's one of those things. And let me ask you though, is like how many, you talk about prosthetics, how many hours did it take in the makeup you know, sitting there getting fitted and, and everything every time before you actually shot. Yeah. Well, they told me, um, that they expected makeup to take about an hour, hour and a half. And it ended up taking three hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, not sure why. I mean, it's all custom made. Um, but it ended up taking about three hours and I'm telling you, it was so real. They did such a fantastic job that as soon as I was finished in makeup, it was time to eat. Uh, we had lunch brought in and I went out to grab some, some lunch and the people who were there serving the food, I could tell they were uncomfortable around. Like they, they didn't want to make eye contact with me. It just looked so real. Wow. Obviously they knew that they were on the set and this. Right. Was, yep. I don't know if they knew it was Star Trek or not, but I never really had that experience before where, where I felt uncomfortable, like the <laughs> eye contact with people. And it's just because it looked so real. It was that worth is, every, every minute of those three hours. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, those, those special effects guys, those, those makeup artists, they, they just really do bring things to life, don't they? These characters and, otherworldly beings we can call them um just so cool so bring us forward a little bit um so you have the project um star trek picard um you know bring us forward a little bit coming off of that yeah so uh obviously once we uh finished that and then of course there was talk about um season two so just kind of waiting for what's going to come about with that. And then, and then COVID hit. So let's see. So Picard, I want to say this season completed in, I, gosh, I want to say it was March, hmm. which is also when, right. When, when COVID really hit us hard. Right. When time. everything shut down. Yeah. Yeah. So this year has been unique. Um, there were a, a, a couple of auditions that I had for, for feature films where I got the part and then we weren't able to shoot it. So I think I still have a couple of films lined up. I was able to only recently uh, start auditioning again, uh, primarily for television, sure. but now we're going back into this lockdown and then the holidays. So things were going to shut down at least, for a couple of weeks for the holidays anyway. Right. So in terms of Hollywood, there, there hasn't been a lot uh, going on now, as I'm as, or I guess, as you mentioned earlier, I am a filmmaker as well. So f following very strict COVID uh, guidelines, yeah. I have been able to squeeze in a little bit of work here and there with, we, you know, we call it skeleton crew, very small sets. Uh, we did that with very frightening tales as well. We were able to shoot a few things, but fortunately, um, because I do stuff myself and then being connected with Suzanne, I've been able to get a little bit of work here and there that will all come out, you know, later, but we haven't, sure. haven't had to shut production down completely. Sure. Sure. Well, and especially challenging for everybody, for sure. But I know it's it's really hard hit the entertainment industry, for sure, right? Especially, you know, everybody, um, especially that lives in the state of California, 
um, you know, very, very restrictive and just a challenging time for sure. Now you talked about um, your connection to military, you know, kind of going back into your personal, um, you know, your personal aspect. Um, you come from a big military family, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. Starting with my father, um, actually served in the Korean war. Um, yeah, he was quite a bit older than my mother is. And, um, so this was all before they even met and got married, but, sure. uh, yeah. So starting with my father, U S army, and then my three older brothers, Marines and army. Oh, and wow. then my youngest, uh, stepbrother also served in the army. Okay. So I'm, I'm the... I'm the one, uh, you call me the black sheep, but I'm the one who didn't go the military route. And to be honest with you, the, probably the only reason I didn't is because I was playing football. When I graduated, I had a chance to go to uh, straight to college and play football. And I yeah. did. I loved football. That was my, that was, that was my dream at that time. Was right. To play right. Pro football. And, uh, yeah, so that's that's the reason I didn't. But yeah, so, my family is very. So you talk about football being one of your loves, and obviously you have a big love for the 49ers. You're a huge 49ers fan. Um, but, you know, did you ever have aspirations of going professional as far as beyond college? Uh, absolutely. Um, when, I was, when I was a kid growing up, um, you know, back in the 49ers heyday with Joe Montana and Jerry Rice. Sure, and all yeah. Those guys. yeah, that that was my that was my world. That that's what I wanted to do more than anything. Um, I was fortunate enough to get to play uh, up at K State, Kansas State under Bill Snyder. But I'll tell you something. We had so we started three wide receivers on offense. I was not one of them. All three that we started went on to the NFL. I was probably, I would say I was a five. I was number five on the depth chart, if you will, for everybody. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wanted to, but it wasn't, wasn't quite big enough, wasn't quite fast enough. I was able to play in college, which was exciting and, you know, a fun, you know, a fun experience. But um, no, that was not, that was not in my future. Okay. Wasn't in the cards for you at that time anyways, right? Um, you know, it's always interesting how life, you know, I guess twists and turns and, you know, how things turn out, but, uh, it's always interesting to, to find that out. Um, so take us into a little bit more about, um, you were talking about very frightening tales. I know that's your latest project. Um, can you share a little bit more with us about kind of like the storyline perhaps and, a little bit so, um, you know, the listeners and viewers can be like, hey, I want to check this thing out um, for sure. Yeah. So essentially it is, um, we would call it a horror anthology. So each episode is, so it's for, it's for TV or TV slash streaming. Each episode is a half an hour. And within that half hour, there will be two to three short episodes mm. and they're all very frightening. So uh, what happened is we have filmed one episode already and that, so, and, and again, there are three stories within that one episode and that has been pitched and presented almost like a TV pilot. Sure. So we have uh, distributors slash buyers right now and it is currently still being negotiated. So the question is, where is it going to be available? How many episodes do they want? Sure. Um, but there's a lot of interest around it. So that's all. It seems to be, uh, you know, a very positive. So I came in after um, they had already filmed a couple of episodes. Okay. And through my connection to Suzanne De Laurentiis, we, um, I was able to write an episode, also act it, because I write as well, so I was able to write an episode, act in it, and now I am uh, writing a second episode. 
okay. which would be just in, in a, you know, somewhere in the future. Nice. Yeah, it's it's you know horror is one of those genres that kind of never goes away. You know, it's right. always. I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you why horror. Is that something that you've always been kind of interested in, or or was it just something that you happened to get involved in, and then it was like, hey, everybody kind of has a <laughs> you know interest in horror. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, any opportunity in Hollywood to write. Sure. And and then put any potentially act in some of your own writing is that's something uh, I think anyone would love to, to jump at that opportunity. So that's first, but um, personally I, I always loved horror as a kid. I grew up watching things. I had no business watching, you know, HBO back in the day, um, you know, exposed us, my brothers and I to all sorts <laughs> of scary things. I don't know. I just, uh, I just always enjoyed it. And um, it's just been thrilling to kind of have the opportunity to write horror. And then when, once you see the see it produced and the finished product, it's amazing how just from idea to completion to see that entire process play out, it's sure. there's definitely a lot of magic, if you will, you know, involved in that. So it's, it's fun. What would you say um, is maybe one of the biggest obstacles in writing horror films and then maybe one of the biggest or you know i i hate to say coolest parts but you know the the cool thing about of doing it you know conversely yeah the two halves yeah those are those are great questions um so as far as the writing goes as far as my writing style uh, and especially with horror is, I, you know, horror is, is often very visual, right? It's what right. we see or don't see. And then our imagination gets involved in there and it, and it sort of ups the attention, so to speak. And so for me, as I'm writing, I, I'm very like a visual writer. So I have these images that I'm trying to fill out so that there's a story around it. And the one that I am currently writing for Very Frightening Tales, um, in fact, I was up late last night typing away on key keyboard trying to connect these dots, but that's the biggest challenge is you have these images, you have these characters, and you start to fill them out. And one of the biggest challenges is how do I connect these dots? Mm -hmm. So I've got this storyline and I have these characters and then I have these images that I know are effective and I think they're going to be scary and I wanna make sure that they're in this project. How do I connect them so that we have a linear sort of beginning, middle, and end? So that's maybe the biggest challenge on the writing side so far. And then as far as the production goes, you know, it's interesting because you're filming a horror film or show and you've got, you know, there's 30 people in this room. Studio lights are everywhere. There's a boom mic in, in you know, just a few inches from your face. And um, there's nothing scary about it at all but then you go back and watch the dailies or you watch the actual footage where you can only see this sort of narrow tight window that the camera's picking up and once they get the light and the color and the sound and you get these real subtle actor expressions to, to just to see how it becomes scary and frightening considering all those circumstances when you were shooting is right. pretty cool because it's, it's not scary when you're doing it. I mean, I know what's going to happen. Right? <laughs> right. And then you get in that, the frame of the camera and you add all those post-production elements and it's scary. And that's just so cool about it because it's, again, I'll go back to that word of magic, but uh, right. it's just such a cool experience. That is very cool. That is very cool. So, um, Brian, what would be something, you know, sometimes, you know, you have folks out there, whether they're transitioning out of the military or um, maybe currently in, but, you know, they have a love of film. They have, you know, and maybe they're looking at going into acting or film. What would be one word of advice that you would share with them? Does it have to be one word? Well, it doesn't have to be one. Maybe one, a couple, few things. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I tell you what, I mean, if you, if you just look at, at television, um, and which, which suits me because I sort of fit that stereotype. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the number of police, fire, military dramas, like one hour uh, episodics that are on television. I mean, that is, is far and away the, um, uh, the most popular, right? There are more shows that, that are centered around law and police and military than any other type any other genre that's on television. So there's opportunity, whether it's you want to be in front of the camera or even behind the camera as a consultant. Mm. Um, I know some military, former military guys who are just on set security. They don't necessarily want to be a a part of the filmmaking. They just want to be close to it. They don't want to be around it. And there's always a need for security on set and they just Mm -hmm. want to kind of fill those shoes. So there's a ton of opportunity in the entertainment business for people with that background. Um, sometimes I, I wish I did have more of that uh, uh, personal background myself, not just all my family, but if I had, there would be some other things that I could uh, bring to the, to the set that sure. right now I need to be taught those things as opposed to if I just knew it. Um, but yeah, I think uh, in terms of really getting connected, um, it's get on set, first of all, however you can. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, you've got to be vocal, ask for what you want. Um, be willing to get connected in any capacity, at least initially, so that you can kind of see how the business works. And there's a lot of competition. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. In this town, in this business, there's a ton of competition. Uh, so you need to make those strong connections, but there is work out there for you if that's what you want to do. And, you know, you got to be patient because it might take, uh, it always takes longer than our own timeline and what right. you know, when we want it to, to happen. It <laughs> right. longer. So sticking around, just being persistent, patient, but, but you got to get out there, ask for what you want, meet people Great. and then being easy and, and cool to work with is, is a huge part of that too. Nice personality and everything as well. Right. Kind of. Sell yeah, it. Just, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of big egos in this town and I yeah. think uh, we don't need more, you know, just yeah. um, be friendly and, and, and do your job well. And, and that will, that will lead to more and more and more work. Like maybe a sure. career as opposed sure. to just a couple of jobs. I heard one time somebody say, you're always auditioning for your next job. You know, no matter what you're doing, you're always, you're always interviewing or auditioning for your next job. And, you know, that always kind of struck with me. You never, even if you believe that you have a, you know, forever job, you know, it's, you're always for that next client or the next, right. And it's like, "Hmm," you know, it's so true. Um, I used to work with a writer for a popular TV show. The show was on the air for six or seven years. It was a very popular show. And the star of the show um, had some health problems. And literally, I mean, this is an Emmy-winning TV show. And literally, uh, over the course of, I want to say, a month, because of the star having these health problems, all the writers, all the producers, all of the, the rest of the cast and crew were out of work just like that. And there's no guarantee that you'll have work right. again. Like how there's no promise that you'll just get picked up on another show. So you're, you're right. You, 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 there's no promises in terms of a career and a future. So you always want to be auditioning, making those connections right. and, and mm-hmm. leaving a real positive impression with everybody. Um, Cause there's just no guarantee. There's no promise for tomorrow. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well said. Um, I wanted to switch gears really big and, and switch over to another aspect that, um, that you do, you have worked um, as I believe it's a financial consultant for many years. Is that correct? Financial advisor. Oh, and then there, coach. Yep. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So share with us a little bit about that because you were sharing what I love so much is you were saying that one of the things that you was on your radar is potentially working with military or inner city folks and a way of giving back or educating folks. But um you know, talk about that briefly, your, your, you know, financial advising and and coaching. 
Yeah. So when I first moved to um, LA right after college, uh, I was pursuing acting. Um, and, you know, I did that for a few years, but you hear this story so many times. I was just kind of spinning my wheels, going in circles. I wasn't booking the big jobs and, you know, I'd get a couple of jobs a year, but nothing was really sticking. And so I just sort of overwhelmingly got this feeling that I needed to do something. I kind of needed to break away for a while and do something else. I needed some more life experience, uh, some business experience, if you will. Uh, and so somehow I ended up getting into finance and I worked for one of the larger broker dealers on the planet um, for 15 years. Oh, wow. And I got to tell you what I learned was this is going to sound weird, but the experience and the knowledge that I gained, it, it was almost worth more than the money that I made over those 15 years. No, that makes I mean, a that lot of sense. sounds crazy. And it's, you know, it's, that's debatable. Sure. But I'm just trying to emphasize how, how important it was. I did, I barely knew the difference between a stock and a bond right. when I got into the business and you know, my parents just retired recently. They, they barely knew the difference sure. and they've worked their whole lives. Right. So it just really struck me how important it is that people are educated and that people understand. And, and let's be honest, it's such a complicated, diverse uh, industry. And you think about retirement savings and planning and investing and just money in general. It's so complicated. Right. And I don't think that's an accident. Most people, whether they're afraid or they're just overwhelmed, they don't know what to do and they don't have all the information and they make, often they make poor decisions. So I'm no longer in that business because I've, I was able to get back into what I've always loved. And that's of course, acting and now filmmaking, but I still have that knowledge and experience. And I want to be able to take that and share it with people who truly need it. Where I was with the broker dealer, um, we were really just working with wealthy people, to be honest. And um, that's, that's good. Everybody needs, needs the help. But I think there's a greater need. I just got more satisfaction and personal fulfillment out of helping people who um, they didn't have all the resources. The financial decisions that they made were critical to their future. Right. And so there are really two areas that I feel I would love to make an impact. One of them is the military, because again, I come from the military family and I know uh, how important that is but not only military, also inner city, because I come from inner city as a child and this, the knowledge and the understanding, you know, there are too many people out there who don't get it. They're making bad decisions and I'd love to be able to help them. Now that's not my career, right? Acting and filmmaking is my career, right. but there are other things that I would love to be able to do and contribute on the side. And that's one of them. Nice. Nice. Love it. I love that aspect. Um, Brian, where can folks go to check out more about you and maybe some of the projects that you're doing? Yeah. So, um, I have a website and this is all for acting and filmmaking stuff. It's uh, videoheadfilms.com. Uh, Videohead Films is my, um, production company that I started back in 2017. So you can see a lot of my work there. Um, as far as what I write and produce myself, excuse me. Um, and then of course, uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I can be Brian DeRozan. I could be followed on Instagram. Um, just at Brian DeRozan. Right. So if you got my name, you can, you can probably find me online. Um, <laughs> uh, now that's just a lot of that is for my personal stuff in terms sure. of like Star Trek and, and things that, even very frightening tales at this point, because I don't, you know, I don't own those. Sure. Um, maybe just IMDB. You could go, you know, find stuff. 
I know. Yeah. I think if you just put in your name too, I, I'm pretty sure that if I remember right, that comes up pretty easy too, as far as um, all the Star Trek and the other stuff comes up pretty, pretty. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. And you know, and I'm, I'm not a huge uh, social media guy, uh, but I, th- I think it's important, you know, if I do want to yeah. reach an audience, um, regardless of what field or what area it's in, I think, you know, you got to have that, at least have right. that presence. Right. So I probably don't post as often as I should. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know. I, I can only sort of, uh, take so much of it and then I kind of get tired of it. It's just, <laughs> you know, but it's important. So right, yep. I should probably get better at that. <laughs> well, it's all good. Well, Brian, thanks so much for taking time today uh, to uh, discuss not only what you've accomplished, but uh, what you got uh, in the hopper, so to speak. And we look forward to keeping tabs and and seeing what you're doing. And uh, we look forward to connecting uh, here in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Uh, Stay safe out there, everybody. Um, We'll get through this. Absolutely. The end is near, I hope. The end is near. But uh, <laughs> right. yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely.